Hi, thank you. It's great to be here and be part of this um, exciting event, especially here in the mission. Um, I, the work I'm gonna show today uh, was created, produced a few blocks from here in the mission, and, and it's, a, it's a place I've spent the longest um, in one place in my life in, is in the mission. So I'm excited to present this here. Uh, so Hydronet is, as was mentioned, uh, it was a response to this call or design challenge um, for a city of the future. Oh, sorry, I was noticing the slides cut off here, but they're fine up there. Um, and it, it went through a first round in New York, LA, and Chicago, and then this second uh, year was based on San Francisco, Atlanta, and Washington, DC. Basically, the challenge is to um, think about your city in 100 years uh, at a very quick uh, pace, is, um, the, was one of the caveats. Um, but one of the things we um, really uh, strongly feel is that in the future, ultimately, cities will have to be ever more interconnected, but also more self-reliant. So that, that was one of the driving ideas. And just to say, this is a um, project in a line of kind of inquiry that's one of the trajectories my uh, studio that I am partners with Lisa Iwamoto and Iwamoto Scott uh, pursues uh, alongside uh, another end of the kind of scale spectrum at uh, 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 digital fabrication and installation projects. And then in the middle, um, the, the kind of more traditional building uh, commissions and interiors ho uh, hope to be informed by these two parallel projectories at either end of the scale spectrum. So uh, the, there were two firsts for us in this uh, project, certainly to be designing a city in one week. As you might see in the upper right there, the, the kind of countdown, uh, eight teams competing, seven days to design and three hours to uh, construct your design uh, installation within the ferry building, in this case is where it was held, and 15 minutes to present. The other first for us was to getting to hold one of those giant checks, which I never thought I'd ever be holding uh, because we were given the grand prize. Uh, so um, this um, statement by the Gabriel Metcalf, the head of SPUR, really set the charge in a way. You know, it's a, a daunting um, thought, but this idea that uh, we've outgrown the original um, boundaries of the Bay Area, it's time to face this fact and start at solving problems at the scale of the mega region. Uh, that, that's, you know, that was in 07, imagine in, in 2108, how ex, you know, extreme if the issue might be if we don't start thinking about it. And so our first um, order of business was to start drawing and thinking on day one, given we the time, the clock was ticking. So we were thinking ac across these scales uh, and in particular, starting at this kind of zoomed out um, condition of, of the entire Bay Area mega region as it's um, thought. And it, it, in order to uh, respond to a projected doubling of, of, of population by 2108, and resist the continual outward sprawl of the Bay Area. What um, we, we um, assumed is that the only option is to, is to, is to turn that growth back in and in, increase density. And so this is a study of the region in terms of nodes of transport that exist and density and how a new pattern of connectivity inspired by uh, something like the diagram on your right, which is this, uh, the, involves the kind of logistics of, of ne network connectivity and how that might be applied at the urban scale. Uh, one of the things in looking at this scale that's critical is the fact that, that the, the reason the, it, the region is here as a, as a um, 
a, a pattern of um, land use and the growth of the city happening in the first place largely has to do with this estuary that the bay forms and the, the trade that that sponsored and so on. But this estuary has rapidly transformed, um, been industrialized, filled in, and so on. It's also under the edges of the, the bay are under another a kind of onslaught if, if predictions come true, which is an estimated uh, rise in sea level of two to five meters. So uh, finding this, um, you know, not necessarily facts yet, but this, this, the scope of this problem, uh, uh, we, we thought about, you know, there, there's either the resistance or the kind of adaptation approach. And, and so uh, rather than try to hold that, assuming we, we may, may not indeed stop some level of sea rise, uh, that we assume that the baylands that would be inundated could turn into a new productive zone. In this case, we're proposing that they become a kind of aquaculture zone producing algae, uh, which has been uh, researched and, and um, worked with, with, with some uh, advancement as, as a kind of alternative fuel raw material. So the notion that the, the flooded lands become now a proactive part of this environment. Uh, the other interesting um, aspect of the region we discovered is in, in our research um, efforts is, is this uh, underlying um, presence of fresh water right beneath our feet, these huge aquifers beneath the peninsula and the East Bay. Uh, yet our fresh water is, is piped from many miles away uh, from the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir. So, uh, to the point, there's so much of it that it's, as you can see from one of these quotes, they pump a million gallons a day, BART does, out of their tunnels into the bay just to get rid of it. It seems a kind of crazy situation to us that we're not tapping into that as an alternate source. And lastly, in terms of this macro scale is, is the, the, you know, fog and, and it's, its presence, but its potential to be a resource as well. Uh, that there's you know, great um, examples uh, in other places of harvesting fog, and here there's certainly enough of it to, to get a good deal of water that way. So this became the ideogram uh, or idea diagram of the project, this kind of um, exchange of the east and west sides of San Francisco. At this point, we're kind of honing, zooming in to San Francisco proper, that being what, you know, the design challenge really asked the, the focus to be on the city of San Francisco. And thinking about this kind of exchange of water from uh, the aquifer and fog and, and hydrogen, or the raw material of algae as uh, uh, um, potentially um, leading to the production of hydrogen fuel. And so how to organize this um, became the question. And uh, what this is is a drawing of what we think of as a kind of multi-scalar, symbiotic, new infrastructural system that's able to organize um, and um, direct the critical flows of water, alternative energy, as well as um, higher capacity transportation than the streets currently allow. Uh, and it does this by being beneath the city. That was the kind of major move to think of if our, you know, it was already attempted to put freeways in the air across uh, San Francisco, which spurred the freeway revolts of the 50s and 60s, and they were stopped dead in their tracks by the citizens, um, luckily. And some came down even uh, after uh, they were stopped due to the earthquake. But th th it seems a, a no-go that, that we would have a, a network of freeways above. But so thinking about what this network could offer, if it, it's, it, our infrastructure that's beneath the city now is completely um, outmoded in some places, dilapidated. There's double water delivery systems. and. 
uh, sewerage systems that dump the runoff uh, right into the bay and so on. So it, it clearly needs rethinking and it certainly will in 100 years. So this is an image depicting uh, this network from beneath the ground looking up and assuming a series of connective elements, which those purple um, pieces are that you're looking at, that connect the, the surface and the, the new network. And the, further delving into the potential of this network and what it can offer, if, if the way it's built, for instance, were to build on um, you know, uh, recent advances in tunnel drilling, robotic uh, tunnel drillers, and as well as ways of constructing the tunnel walls, uh, th such as uh, carbon nanotube construction, we're assuming that what, if you look back 100 years uh, and what San Francisco was and the technology that um, was driving the culture, uh, the leap we've made in 100 years hence um, could certainly capitalize on, on these kind of bleeding edge technologies, as well as um, trying to envision what those new kinds of urban spaces and places could be like. That, that we felt was our uh, charge. And so how to represent this is, is a key question. Uh, and, and we resorted to a, a kind of large laser cut transparent model where we took a series of cross sections through the whole city and, and can, you can start to see the layering of, of ideas and systems uh, one on top of the other. As uh, the model at the bottom was a second round of kind to, trying to re um, uh, envision how that series of layers is represented uh, for the uh, exhibition at the Cooper Hewitt National Design Triennial a couple of years after. And this is an image of the original model where you see the, the network um, suspended beneath and this series of connective elements from below. And so to kind of zoom in, uh, it, it seemed necessary to think holistically about the entire expanse of San Francisco. So we cut a cross, -sex cross section from the Pacific Ocean to the Bay with, you know, with the possibility of situating these different localized strategies along that section. So along the uh, western zone, we imagine that's where, where the large end of the end of that large aquifer comes um, underneath uh, cl close to um, Ocean Beach and th how that uh, could generate a new kind of civic landscape as well as a new um, increased density reaching out towards the Pacific Ocean in terms of uh, new places to live. And these, these renderings here, keep in mind the green uh, is beneath. That, that's the challenge, how to you know, represent it with an aerial view. Uh, but we're also concerned you know, that there are places which had been amazing destinations in San Francisco's past and how those might transform and be revived. For instance, Sutro Baths, which was this communal, um, so, you know, a pretty kind of new form of social space uh, for the US to, to this giant scale baths and that that might uh, be born again in the same location. A couple of the other important components that we proposed uh, were one the so-called fog flower and another geothermal mushrooms, uh, which are these large um, civic scale landmarks that would not only you know, one, the fog flower is about the harvesting of fresh water from fog through this, the actual skin of the building, and the, the geothermal mushroom is about tapping into this uh, large resource of, of geothermal that happens to be beneath the city. Um, but the, those don't have to be kind of dead, um, static, uh, or hidden conditions in the city. They might offer new places to go and, and be. And so um, the, the part of the, the pro proposition for us was to provoke, I mean, to, to 
think about the city, which is, high, is very resistant to change in its built environment, and to think you know, that there are ways of coexisting uh, and, and, and co-evolving uh, new architectures. And we, we thought of them as almost blooming or, or sprouting from this network beneath that's feeding uh, uh, the, the old city and the new city simultaneously. Um, a couple of these fog flowers. Um, further to the east along the bay where this uh, aquaculture zone is, we imagined a kind of sprouting of these um, at what we called algae towers, horizontal algae ponds and vertical towers, which would, um, and this is an image, a detail of the model and a drawing of some of that area uh, along the bay side, but where the, um, there, there could be a kind of co-existence uh, of, of the growth of algae and the increased density of, of living quarters uh, at, at the same time. It, those, there need not be a, a kind of segregation of those worlds. And so these are renderings trying to, you know, in a granted a kind of cartoony way, but with a week to do all this, uh, we, we had to kind of move quickly, but to, to study this uh, new world and the, and the merging with the old. Uh, the other thing we assumed is, you know, a lot of people talk about density and cars being at odds, but if, uh, you know, it's, it's possible, if not probable, that cars are not bound to the ground. And there's also an argument to be made that maybe in the U.S., there'll never be a complete widespread acceptance of full mass transport as it exists now. And with the way, you know, the, the Google cars and so on, self-piloted uh, vehicles, vehicles that form into train-like modes when they're in, you know, commute mode, and all of these possibilities, to, to us, we don't se separate those worlds and because they're in very different camps. You know, people who argue the car has destroyed the city and, it, mass transit will save us, but in, in reality, we feel uh, it's going to be a hard sell to, to, for peop, Americans to give up individual transport. But so if they're not bound to the ground at the same time, they're likely not going to be allowed to fly through the skies of the streets of San Francisco, a la you know, the fifth element or something like that, where you see it, it just is hard to imagine that ever going over. But since we're thinking we're building a new network beneath the city anyway to manage such flows of movement of goods, people, um, and so on, that, that that could be a way of moving quickly from point A to point B. This is a 3D printed model of a couple nodes of the network and an image of kind of moving into one of these portals at the periphery of the city down below ground where we imagine this whole other world and life could happen, uh, that there's not necessarily a conflict between traffic, if it's clean burning, autopiloted, uh, zero emission hydrogen fueled, and, and you know, social spaces, for instance, new forms of public space uh, that might emerge, like here we're representing a kind of new idea about uh, the, the um, bat, public bath, for instance, that, that we had in this city. And um, uh, last image of this project, a, a kind of just um, aerial view of imagining, again, this, this transformation by coexistence with the old. And just to, I'm going to end with a couple projects that one before and one after to kind of situate that project in it in this line of thinking in, in our work. And it, it, we, it, there, in all three cases, we've been asked to be part of these kind of speculative um, explorations of the future, either near or far. In this case, it was the Vitra Design Museum in Germany and the Art Center College in Pasadena co-curated a show, Open House Architecture and Technology for Intelligent Living. Essentially, it was a of kind of critique and, re, of, and rethinking of the smart house paradigm. Uh, and so we were, in, we again zoomed out. We felt we had to, even though they asked for a single house design. 
Here um, we chose Treasure Island, which is a, a place that's in need, uh, cer certainly, of transformation. It has all kinds of issues of toxic ground, unstable ground. Um, in, it, it was already kind of in process as a transforming place. It was also an artificial island to begin with. But we imagine re kind of introducing wetlands uh, in that area. The island itself, Yerba Buena is a natural island, Treasure Island is a man made island for the expo uh, that uh, celebrating the completion of the Bay and um, Golden Gate Bridges. Uh, th when, after the exo expo, it reverted to Navy land. And so it, it's a highly toxic uh, ground we've in, inherited. And so that kind of ideogram at the top imagines like this um, more ideal scenario of how, you know, what if the island could give back fresh water to the bay? Uh, and not only treat the toxic land, but actually um, be a kind of a, more of an organism um, that evolves beyond that. And so the house uh, ultimately is the focus at this point, but the idea is that it's, it's inseparable from this new um, reformed wetland hydro uh, system that um, we, I don't have time to go into all the detail of this project, but it, here it's uh, seen the uh, 3D printed model of it uh, where it was part of the recent SF MoMA show uh, uh, on, on Bucky Fuller, uh, the utopian impulse, it, 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 focusing on his uh, um, um, impact in the Bay Area. And we, we certainly feel in sync with his desire to, to you know, um, address this conflict between nature and technology and, that, you know, a kind of dream of his was to, that there need not be a conflict. Uh, and that's a driver behind a lot of this work, but we feel we kind of diverge in other areas, specifically in, in trying to resist this kind of top-down, you know, pure geometries that were part of his design world, you know, inevitably, uh, and, and, and look to more kind of bottom-up possibilities. And here, uh, there's a diagram of what the house, how it uh, would perform in terms of environmental responsiveness. Uh, in that its skeleton is thought of as hollow and forming two networks that want, for one, harvest uh, rainwater off the skin of the building and filter that water, and another is a system of gray water filtration. So basically, within the walls of the house, it's, it's treating and managing its own water and tapping into the macro scale of the uh, canals at, at the island scale. And then built up uh, in the walls uh, is proposed a series of uh, differently performing layers, phase change insulation, um, a, a kind of media surface uh, at the inside that defines the space, and this ability to shift from opaque to translucent either in a kind of auto-responsive mode to the outer environment, heat gain, and so on, or more kind of uh, user-controlled by the dweller. And that is uh, best represented, this kind of state of flux or transformation that the house's envelope would constantly be in, or if not, if it's kind of put in this more quiet, opaque mode, uh, it would not be in, but you can see that in a video, which I'm not showing today. It was part of the exhibition, but it's on our website and it's around to be seen. Uh, it's best in 4D, but I, I don't have time to show it today. And lastly, the last project quickly uh, was a couple years after um, the 2008 city, that, that jellyfish house was a couple years prior, and this is a couple years after the HydroNet City of the Future project. Uh, here, it's, it's, um, this is Zuccotti Park, uh, a different form of occupation, clearly, but it was part of an exhibition where the park was occupied by design proposals from a number of designers, artists, architects, as a, as a public exhibition that people could engage and walk through freely. Our project was one of several in this uh, Five Principles for Greenwich South, organized by the Downtown Alliance, Alliance for Lower, 
for Lower New York, and uh, ARO, or Architecture Research Office, who oversaw the kind of bigger collection of projects. The, the site we happened to kind of receive out of this multi-acre um, zone that, that the study focused on, and, and that was kind of divvied up amongst all the artists, designers, and architects. Our site happened to span at that pink uh, or magenta footprint across formerly two blocks, and now it's shut down by a big MTA parking garage crossing over. And so the other aspect of our site, so there's a desire to bring back that east-west connectivity that that little street offered, uh, but is the fact that this site has the kind of air rights and the economics to be a very tall building, and there, uh, there's no getting around that. It's, it's a kind of site for an iconic tower. So we took that on uh, and, and tried to use uh, some of this similar thinking and processes in terms of capitalizing on, on advanced computation. And to, these are a series of parametric studies of investigating the, the twisting together basically of two towers from those two footprints around this void that rises up towards the top, which then aligns with Fifth Avenue to the north in Manhattan. But more importantly, that void forms the heart of the tower, and there's this kind of exoskeleton that's responsively um, uh, modulated relative to heat gain and views and so on on the outside. And on the inside, at the heart of the building, is this um, light uh, void where we're, we're using fiber optics. It's, it's a medium and a technology we've explored in a few other projects, but to try to pull the daylight from the sky down to these darker uh, street areas you find in lower Manhattan. And then at the moment that the tower splits across those two sites is this double atrium that we thought of as the kind of lungs of the building. And uh, they would have a way, uh, built into the floors of the atrium are these terraria, terrarium-based uh, um, filtration systems, a way to remediate and filter the air with, uh, you can imagine a tower this big has a lot of air to handle and to kind of address issues of indoor air quality and so on. And, and, but to make that visible, similar to the uh, jellyfish house or for that matter, the hydro net, to take these embedded systems uh, and, and th th to have the kind of space making celebrate them. So within this um, scale that we felt was appropriate to a kind of civic um, uh, f f gesture and form of bridging the street and um, also looking back to buildings from 100 years earlier at the turn of the last century in, in Manhattan in particular, there were a number of visionary architects who imagined architecture and infrastructure merging to form a kind of a new world. Uh, and so with that um, at the end, and thank you very much for let, letting me present the work.